Welcome back to the 34th week of the I Thirst follow-up. Let's start with prayer. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Today we're speaking about the Lord's Prayer. This is the prayer that is given straight from God to us. This is a very important realization that we could never have written the Lord's Prayer. Right. The Hail Mary obviously was given to us by St. Gabriel and St. Elizabeth, and the last part is uh, written later on, right, after the Bible, and then they were all kind of conglomerated together to get the Hail Mary, right? But that's not the way with the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer came straight from the divine mouth of Jesus, and so this is why this prayer is so powerful. And this is why this prayer should constantly be on our minds and our hearts. It is ordered in the most perfect way. It asks for everything that we need and in the proper order. And of course, this is why Jesus gave it to us because he was asked, how should we pray? Teach us to pray. And so then he taught us in the most perfect way. So our father, St. Teresa of Avila says you can spend your whole life basically in mental prayer just thinking about our father. That is such an amazing divine revelation that our Lord gives to us that we can pray like this, right? That's why in the mass it says we dare to pray. We could never have dared to say our father except Jesus told us to say it. Right? This is something that is should just blow our mind, right? Our Father, we can call the most blessed Trinity our Father. You know, this is just something that we don't deserve, but God said, I love you so much, I want you to call me Father. Right? And so this is the pure divine goodness of God. And Saint Teresa of Avila just says, you know, anytime you don't know what to think about, just our Father, right? And then just think about what that really means, okay? Obviously, the first word, our, we are a church, right? The Holy Catholic Church, here we are one. It's never my Father, right? Here it's our Father. We always pray this prayer, not only just for ourselves, but it's really for the entire church and so that people can come to the true church, right? So, our Father, and of course, Father here is referring to the Blessed Trinity, the Creator of everything. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here, the Blessed Trinity creates everything. And so, insofar as He is our Creator, we come from Him, and He is our Father. So, who art in heaven, here we remember where God is. This is very important. We forget so easily who God is. And this just makes us say the craziest things or even think the craziest things about God. For example, some people, you know, including ourselves, you know, we will start to blame God. Why did you do this? Why did you do this to me? Why did you do this to my family? Why did you let this person suffer? Why did you let this child suffer, you know? And when we do that, we obviously are doing it out of weakness, but it's really because we don't understand who God is. On the last day, when we look back at ourselves and we see God right there, we'll be so embarrassed that we said those things, you know? And we really, when we see God, we will not be able to ever say that, you know, like, why were you not there? Because our eyes and our mind and our heart will be open and we will see that He did everything always for us, you know, and then we'll just be flabbergasted and how, how we did not see it, you know. And so here, right, we have to remember who God is and where he is, right? Our Father who art in heaven, right? And heaven is the perfect place and he does everything perfectly from there, right? So God can't mess up, right? It's very important. Who and where is God? He is in heaven. It is perfect there. He does everything perfectly there. There are no mistakes whatsoever. Everything happens for a reason. Everything bad will be turned, whether we want it or not, right, into his greatest glory. Otherwise, God is not God, right? So this is all part of who art in heaven, right? Heaven is not just some, like, place over there where, you know, it's so far, but it is the place from which everything is done and it's perfect, right? And so this is the idea of heaven that we should have, not just, like, 
a place that we have to get to, right? It is the seat and the throne of God's omnipotence and omniscience, right? It is the seat and throne of God's almighty power where he exercises all of his influence. And this is what heaven is, right? So really, when we think about heaven, we should really be almost, as it were, shaking, you know, because of what heaven is. It is the throne of almighty God where he exercises his complete omniscience he knows everything, right, perfectly. He works everything perfectly. And it's omnipotence, right? So, who art in heaven, right? And then, hallowed be thy name. So, God's name is holy. And the name of God is something that, again, is just a pure gift. We have the name of God, especially with the name of Jesus, which means Savior. And we have this name where we can call upon him and we can, with the breath that just comes from our mouth, right? It's just Jesus, right? Or God. And here the divine name Jesus is just a puff of breath that comes. But with that puff of breath, right? God, basically, he comes down from heaven to help us do whatever we want, right? That is in accordance with his will. Our Lord tells us, ask anything in my name and I will give it to you, right? And all we have to do is say, Jesus, help me with this. Of course, if it's a good thing according to his will. And so here we say, ask anything in my name and it will be given to you. So hallowed be thy name is a holy name. And we see that we want his name to be hallowed. That is, we want everyone to know the holiness of God's name, that it is a name that is so set apart. Remember, holiness means being set apart. And then even more, why is it set apart? A lot of people don't make this next step. It's set apart because it's transcendent, right? Something that is set apart is so above us. And so God's name is holy because it's set apart from ours. It's not an earthly name, but it is so transcendent and so infinite. It goes beyond our like little peeny selves, right? It just goes so far beyond, right? That's what it means to be holy. For example, for our lady to be holy, her holiness just is so far beyond us. We can't even begin to imagine her holiness. I tell my students this when I say, what does it mean for Mary to rejoice? So in the Easter season, we say, Queen of Heaven, rejoice, Alleluia. What is that rejoicing? Is it just like, yay, you know, that kind of rejoicing, right? So I give the example here, if Mary suffered at the foot of the cross and her suffering was second only to Jesus, right? When Jesus suffered on the cross, if we just take a little bit, a little bit, teeny like one millionth gazillionth part of Jesus suffering and we put it in our souls we would explode we would not be able to take it just even the teeniest bit of suffering that Jesus experienced on the cross we put it in our soul right we could not handle it we would die and then just put the same teeny beeny teeny weeny bit of suffering right in the entire universe the whole universe could not take it it would just be decimated right this is very important to realize how much our lord suffered right now take our lady she's the second one who suffered after our lord she suffered the most after our lord you just take a teeny weeny bit of her suffering you put it in your soul but in my soul, we would just be wiped out and dead right there, right? We don't realize how much she suffered. We take a little bit of hers, the universe could not even sustain that teeny bit of suffering, right? Now then take her joy, right? That's kind of the sad part, that's kind of the sorrowful part. But here, now take the joy of Mary. Obviously, her joy at the resurrection of our Lord is something beyond her sorrow, right? Then you take the sorrow, the joy of Our Lady, right? You put it into our soul. And then we realize that we couldn't even live with even just a bit of that joy. So when, we, when we say, Queen of Heaven rejoice, this I always tell the little kids, like, you know, this is like the joy that will surpass, you know, like five million atomic bombs. You know, you can't even put a measure on it. This is why the demons, they are so powerful. They can rip the universe into shreds just by thinking it, right? But obviously God doesn't let it, let them. They can just do that, even like a very weak one, right? Because they're purely spiritual. Our universe is material. Material things are nothing to them. They can move it around so easily. They don't even break a sweat because they don't even have sweat glands. <laughs> and so here we see that the demons are so powerful, right? But when they hear the name of Mary, right, they realize what that joy is in Our Lady 
and they just run because they cannot even match her, right? That's just like how amazing it is, right? And so here we're thinking about all these things, right? Holiness, the holiness of God is something way beyond what we can imagine, right? So that's what, when we say, hallowed be thy name, we're thinking of the holiness of Mary, that's already something we can't even imagine. And then now the holiness of Almighty God, you know, this is just obviously mind-blowing. So then, hallowed be thy name, right? And then, thy kingdom come. So we want his kingdom to come, right? That is, we want everything to be finished, right? We want his reign to be complete so that now everything is finished, right? Um, and then here we want everybody to be, you know, part of the Catholic Church. That's his kingdom, right? We want everybody to be saved um, and we want everybody to know the truth. So thy kingdom come, and we know obviously that his kingdom is already here internally, but his kingdom is not yet here externally, right? That comes at the end of the world. <laughs> and so remember, our Lord says, my kingdom is not of this world, right? If I wanted to, I could get, you know, how many legions of angels to just finish everything. The Roman army could not even stand a chance you know, against one legion of angels, even actually one angel. is <laughs> You don't even need a legion of angels. The Roman army could be wiped out by one angel, the lowest angel, right? And so here we see that um, our Lord's kingdom is not of this earth, right? It does begin internally through the reign of grace. So a kingdom is ordered, right? Especially God's kingdom is the most ordered. So what is the kingdom of God? It's obviously the church. And then we see that the kingdom of God also exists internally in those souls who have grace, okay? Now, externally, obviously, there are still some bad people in the government, in the world, etc., and all those kind of things, right? So God's kingdom is not externally there yet, right? Uh, in the end of the world, when Jesus comes, everybody will bow down before God, and then everything will be, uh, you know, very, very clear who's in charge. So then the external kingdom of God will be manifest to everybody, and that will be at the end of the world. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, right, we want everybody to become Catholic, join, of course, come to the true church, come to the sacraments, know the truth, etc. But we're also praying that, you know, we get ready for the last judgment, you know. We're getting ready for that time when God's kingdom will be made manifest and everybody will have to acknowledge the power of God. So, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right? We want everybody to do God's will. This is the only way that we're going to be happy. And so, we've got to spread that to everybody, right? This is why the Our Father is such a powerful prayer and it's always about we, you know, it's not just about me, it's about all of us. We want every soul to come to Jesus, right? We want everybody to know the truth. We want everybody to know the beauty of Mary. We want everybody to know the beauty of the sacraments. And so here we say, thy kingdom come, they will be done on earth, right here, as it is in heaven. So we want everybody to listen to God, just like everybody in heaven listens to God, right? This is that will solve everything, you know. There's no other solution whatsoever. And so, thy kingdom come, they will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And so here we pray for our physical sustenance. This is very uh, important. We can also pray that, you know, our family survive physically and monetarily. God um, also helps us physically and monetarily. We can pray for these things, obviously. But, the more important daily bread is the Eucharist, and this, of course, is priceless. So, give us this day our daily bread means really primarily let me love the Eucharist, right? Help me to get to Mass, right? I want to be able to love God in Mass, in the Holy Eucharist. Give us this day our daily bread. Help me to love Jesus in the most blessed sacrament of the altar, which is his true flesh and his true blood there. So give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And here we see that this is highlighted especially, right? The Eucharist is here and then just like God forgave us and gave his body for us and his blood for us to eat and drink, then we see that just as God forgave us, we have to forgive those who hurt us. Because here we see that we cannot hold on to grudges. The longer we hold on to grudges, 
here it does not let God come in, right? It just blocks everything. Our soul becomes black. It becomes chained. It's not able to be free to fly to the heights of heaven. And so this is why our Lord especially says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Because we can't get all these graces and we can't get, you know, this love of the Eucharist. We cannot really do God's will if we're just holding on to this grudge and we can't let go of something that somebody did to hurt us even very badly and so here we just give them to jesus and we just go up to heaven we leave them to jesus that's all we have to do it's it's actually simple in that regard it's hard emotionally but even then we just say jesus i give you my hurt emotions and i give everything to you i forgive them and i let you take care of them Okay, and so here, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. Now, this is very important that when we're praying this and lead us not into temptation, this wording is very important because here some people want to change it. And here it's important that the fathers of the church always interpret it as lead us not into temptation. Like God is not going to make us sin, obviously. This is very important to realize, right? We're asking God to give us the grace so that we won't walk into the trap of temptation, right? And that is sin. So when it says lead us not into temptation, uh, here, it's not saying that God makes a sin, right? We're, it's saying, please let me not step into the trap of temptation and therefore sin, right? In other words, give me the grace so that I can avoid the trap, right? I don't want to step into the trap, right? So here, lead us not into temptation, right? So in other words, oh, let me go this way, not that way, right? So that's just clear it's what, what, what it's saying, right? It's not wrong when we say, lead us not into temptation. It's very important that we understand what that means. Don't lead me into the snare, right? The snare is like that hunter's trap that goes, whoosh, right? So here, lead me not into it because then, ouch, you know, I'm going to get trapped, right? So here, I want to go this way, right? Give me the grace to go this way because as soon as I'm in the trap, that means I sinned already. Okay, so lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And here, of course, we, we understand this, of course, the evil one who is Satan. And, of course, he wants us to sin. So lead us away from Satan and lead us from every sin. And so here we see every single beautiful thing that we can pray for. And then we see at the end of the Our Father all the obstacles that keep us from the beautiful things at the beginning, right? Of give me, give us this day our daily bread. Give me every grace to do your will. Help me to be you know, always part of your kingdom, right? Those are the beautiful things at first. And then the ending of it, as the fathers of the church teach us, are all those obstacles, right? The temptation, obviously, and the evil one. And so here we see that in the Our Father, our Lord covers everything. I mean, it just goes through the whole expanse of everything, right? Give us all the good things, protect us from the evil things, right? There's not really much else besides that, right? Give us the good things and don't let us lose them help me, protect me from all the evil ones and everything that will want to take away those good things from me. And here we really see that if we ever want to teach anybody about the faith, all that we need to do is just go through the Our Father. And this is exactly what, for example, the catechisms do. They go through the Our Father, they go through the Hail Mary, they go through the Creed. But here the Our Father, it really just teaches us so much about the faith. And this is why the commentaries of the Fathers of the Church, they all have, this is what the Our Father means. There are the beautiful petitions of the Our Father. Everything that we could ever want in the right order is in the Our Father. And so it's a perfect tool of evangelization. Like, what do I do to convert souls? Well, just talk about the Our Father. You know, how can I bring souls to Jesus? Well, let's just talk about the Our Father and what it really means and how God gave it to us as the perfect way to pray and then here to save souls and bring them to the heart of Jesus.